Okay, so this is lecture number 27, the Wireless Communications Lab. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, so, as I mentioned last week, uh, class is going to be canceled on Wednesday. I was hoping to reschedule today, but I wasn't able to reschedule it uh, due to some other commitments. So, my plan is to schedule the recording on Friday, and I don't have a time yet, but I've asked for a time in the morning, so hopefully that time will be... 9 or 10 in the morning on Friday. And then um, it will be most useful if you email me topics that you want specifically discussed because I'm going to try to summarize the whole class in one lecture, which is a lot of material in a small amount of time. So if there's something in particular you want discussed, I'd rather do that. Otherwise, I will just, you know, go through the, the lecture outline. Uh, and then these are just reminders also that, you know, I'm going to drop the lowest homework grade, but I do encourage you to work on the homework this week because there's not a lot of material in the textbook about MIMO communication. So I'm afraid if you don't work on the homework that you're um, going to be at a disadvantage on the exam. And then also the lab this week is, is optional. And so, you know, of course, there would not be a report or anything for this week's lab. Oh, yeah. Um, last thing I forgot to mention is that, uh, unfortunately, I have a dental appointment scheduled after class today, so I won't be in my office hours. I had to schedule the six months in advance. If anyone's ever had a teeth cleaning, you know that these people, like, it's impossible to ever get in anyone's schedule. You know, you go there and you book, like, six months in advance. You're like, oh, yeah, it's already booked out the next year. Like, well, okay, so how am I supposed to get my teeth cleaned every six months? Anyways, so I'm sorry about that. So my plan would be to, um, you know, have some extra office hours on Friday, uh, ideally after the recording of the class, just to discuss questions about generally about the lecture here. Um, all right, so with that, so what we're going to do today is we're going to go through, um, first of all, the spatial multiplexing system block diagram. So this is something I did want to do last week. I didn't get to it here. So what you'd be able to do is to draw a block diagram of the transmitter and receiver with spatial multiplexing, you know, using the notation that we've built up in the class, so as if you were going to build this in the lab. And then the second thing we're going to do is I'm going to introduce this concept of MIMO OFDM. And you should be able to explain how spatial multiplexing can be applied to frequency selective channels using OFDM, and then draw the transmit and receive block diagrams. And then the final thing that we're going to do if, if we have time, and this is actually a topic that I usually cover earlier before the MIMO section, but... Um, I didn't get to it this time here. So I'm going to talk about a, the link budget. And so the link budget is, it, it is an accounting of gains and losses in the system link. And you can use it to compute different things, like, for example, the range of transmission. We've done a little bit of it already. But I wanted to just to go through a practical example of the link budget. And so if we have time, we'll go through that here. All right, so with that. Let's start off with spatial multiplexing system, the block diagram here. So in a sense, this is good review here. So let's uh, start out here. So this block diagram would be useful if, for example, you are... Um, you know, trying, trying to prototype spatial multiplexing at some point in, um, you know, perhaps not for this class, because if you're doing this for your project, you've probably already done it by now, given that it's due this Friday. Uh, I hope so, at least. Uh, so let's look at the transmit structure here. So on the transmitter, um, and, and again, there's different ways to draw and you know, illustrate spatial multiplexing depending on where you do the constellation mapping and the coding. So I'm going to illustrate one, um, as they say in the patent world, preferred embodiment here. So we'll start with our bits here. These are our pres presumably our coded bits at this point, going into a symbol mapping operation. So the symbol map here is... Um, you know, the usual QAM type mapping here. And then the, the main 
difference between spatial multiplexing and a single antenna system is just going to be this space-time coding, the spatial multiplexing block here, which I'm drawing as a serial to parallel converter from 1 to NT. And so this takes our scalar symbols at the input and creates our vector symbols at the output here. And then after that, everything else is essentially just like what we had before. You would have the upsampling per antenna stream, a match, you know, your transmit pulse shaping filter here, another transmit pulse shaping filter here, and then a discrete to continuous converter operating at T over L, another discrete to continuous converter operating at T over L, and then the power scaling. Note that I'm being careful to put that square root of NT here in the power scaling. It's right there. Another square root of VX over NT here, and then the RF and your transmit antenna here. Okay, so this is the um, in a transmitter structure. And so the, the main you know innovation here is really this piece here. which is the spatial multiplexing operation. So, any questions about this block diagram? Now, a couple of things that you could see that might be different in other implementations. You know, here, I've done the symbol mapping before the spatial multiplexing operation. It is also possible to modulate different order constellation symbols on the different antennas. That's more common when we apply beamforming or precoding. Uh, but there's other ways to write this where you'd have the symbol mapping on the other side of the serial to parallel converter. There's also, you can do the same thing with error control coding. So here I'm imagining these bits have already been passed through the forward error correction. But that forward error correction could also vary per antenna, and that could be done on the other side of the serial to parallel converter. So these are implementations you actually will find in, in different standards, do it different ways. Now, other things here, I mean, perhaps the only other part that's interesting is I'm using the same transmit pulse shaping filter here. Now, I, I believe, though I can't remember a specific paper, but now there are papers where they use different pulse shaping filters here, but there's nothing that I've seen that I think is it used in any other systems here. So pretty much they use the same, you know, pulse shaping filters here operations. Now, since we're looking at the spatial multiplexing block diagram, it's also useful to think about, you know, what would this look like if we had some of the other uh, transmit um, structures for multiple antennas here. So some of the other ones that we've looked at, um, one is transmit beamforming. I'm not going to draw out the whole diagram again. I'm just going to put what's in this dashed box here. So the transmit beamforming, the symbols would be coming in, and then they get multiplied by these complex weights, which we were using, I suppose, F. And this is the output here. And so here, you would replace that spatial multiplexing block with this block right here. And also recall there's some other features of the system that I'm not really showing you here, like, for example, that you need some kind of a feedback to compute these weights. Or otherwise, you need some kind of channel state information. Now, we haven't talked about exactly how to do beamforming in the case of a MIMO communication channel. We only talked about it for either SIMO or MISO, but it does extend to MIMO. I won't explain the details of that. You have to take the space-time 
communication course to, to find that out. Um, but, but what you can note here is that, see, one symbol comes in, and that same symbol comes out on every antenna, just multiplied by a different complex number. Whereas with spatial multiplexing, symbols come in, and they get shuffled and sent on different antennas. So, so some symbols go on one antenna, different symbols go on other antennas. Now, the other block we could also put on here would be, you know, we talked about the Alamuti code. Now, Alamuti can be written using, um, if, we, if we use a whole bunch of upsampling and downsampling operations, but I'm just going to write um, you know, something that looks more like this here. <laughs> And yeah, that's I'm trying to think if there's an easier way. I can think of another way to write it. It's it's more complicated than this here. The thing about the Alamuti code, which is also like transit beamforming, is that the symbols come in and the symbols come out at the same rate here. So if I have like, you know, S of N, S of N plus one, et cetera, here coming in. The Alamuti code is going to produce at its output some sequence that looks like, let's see, we're going to get S of, something like this here, S of 2n, and then minus S conjugate 2n plus 1, S of 2n plus 1, S conjugate of 2n. So it produces at its output something like this here. So I didn't draw that um, in a really elegant way. But hopefully you get the idea here. So here, if, if I put my finger here, this would look basically like spatial multiplexing. Because I'm sending, if with two antennas, I'd be sending even on one antenna, odd on the other. But with Almuti, I send like the spatial multiplexing vector, then I send another specially designed vector that contains the same information that lets us do that interesting Alamuti trick. And Alamuti code you can also use in an MIMO communication channel, um, which I didn't, didn't show you, but it turns out the derivation follows. And that would be a great uh, problem to have on the, the final exam, for example. Hopefully I'm not giving away my problem that's on the final, but anyways, just trying to give you an idea here of the way I'm thinking. All right, any questions about these options here? Okay, so let's uh, continue with the receiver. So the receiver structure is more complicated. Let me try to draw it like this. It takes me only 27 lectures to realize I have to turn the page for the receiver diagram. At least I figured it out before the 28th lecture. Okay, so let's put the RF here. Let's put the RF here. Now, one thing is that the way I'm drawing the, the block diagram here, I'm assuming that we have the same reference clock driving the RF. So the oscillators are being generated by the same um, carrier. And by the same logic, the continuous to discrete or analog to digital converters are also being driven at the same clock. There are extensions to, to MIMO receivers where this isn't the case. It just makes things a lot harder. So, you know, if we were integrating everything together on like one chip, I mean, you would just definitely would do the synchronization. You would not not try to solve this using signal processing. It's much easier just to route a, a wire over and have a splitter. It's not not actually that trivial, but it's it's a typically better than trying to fix it later. Signal processing in this case. So after this here, we have exactly the same operation we had before, which would be a match filter on each um, antenna stream. 
And you know, more generally, this could just be a low-pass filter, or it could just be skipped entirely here. And we have a, let's shift this over here. Now, the sample synchronization, because I'm drawing the narrow band spatial multiplexing, so we need the sample sync here. Now, one thing to note is that because my, I'm using the same reference here, I'm going to use the same correction factor here. And I'm going to have one joint symbol synchronization block. And so ideally, you could come up with a symbol synchronization algorithm that would use the outputs of all of the antennas to compute the best um, sample offset. So that's a symbol synchronization here. And then this is going to be followed by a downsampling by M for the same reasons that we upsampled there. And then after this here, hmm. Now the sad realization has hit that even though I turned the page, I still won't finish the block diagram on this one line. Shoot. Oh, well. All right. E to the J, 2 pi, epsilon hat of N. This is my correction, my frequency offset correction term here. And for the same reasons I mentioned before, I can use the same correction factor here for all of the antennas. And then I also have my frame synchronization here. That's my little advancing operation for the frame sync. And for a multiple receive antenna systems, so we're going to do perform joint CFO and frame synchronization here. So I'm going to put this in this box here. Oh, I, I might actually make it. Hmm. Yes. All right, then after here, so here's normally where we would have the equalizer. In a scalar case, this would just be inverting by the channel. Now, what we're going to do is, for example, supposing we're doing a linear receiver, we're going to put this um, matrix inverse here. And to get that matrix channel, we need a, you know, some block here to compute H inverse, that's our equalizer, and we need a block to estimate the channel itself. And then to do this, we need all of the inputs from here. Yeah, we need all of the, the inputs from here. To come in to compute that H inverse there and then Oh, sorry, to estimate the channel. Shoot. Ah, right down here. All right, so after this, um, we've now got the symbol detect operation. So this is over here, symbol detect. <clears throat> and then this is followed by the, we could put the spatial, inverse spatial multiplexing block here. 
this NT to one operation. And then I take the output of this and put it in the inverse bit to symbol mapping. And then I end up with my bits here. Ah, yes, right there. Okay. Other things to notice here. This, this whole operation here in this red box corresponds to like the zero forcing receiver. So if you had like a maximum likelihood receiver, instead of having this H inverse and symbol detect, you'd basically just have a big block that'd be like vector symbol detect. I mean, there wouldn't be anything else that we could, we could list there here. This is the inverse spatial multiplexing. Another thing to notice here is the NT. So this is the number of transmit antennas at this point. Whereas over here, all these operations are done based on the number of receive antennas. Other things to notice, um, you know, we have, because we have multiple receive antennas, you have a whole bunch of filtering operations in parallel. You have the joint symbol sync, the joint CFO. So all of these operations, presuming that you're using the observations from all the antennas, are going to have higher complexity if you're doing something reasonably good here. So this is going to be, you know, complexity grows at least with the number of receive antennas, if not more than that, depending on the, the kind of algorithm that you're using. The ones like we've used in class, well, it should grow, yeah, basically this, these should be linear, the, the filtering operations, because you're just doing a bunch of filters at once. The symbol sync... Depends on how we do that, actually. And the joint CFO also depends on how we do that, how we do the combining from the different antennas. All right, well, that's the spatial multiplexing receiver. Any questions on this here? So I will pan through the whole thing here. RF, filtering, symbol sync, CFO, H inverse, receiver here. So hopefully you have a, a sense of how you might actually do this in the lab. So the trick in the lab would be actually to get these operations here to happen with the same reference. It turns out with the USRP you can do that easily with two USRPs because of the way that they're connected together with that what they call MIMO cable. It's much harder if you want to connect four together and you actually need to have an external um, clock or you need to have one act as a master and you have to route the other ones to the other USRPs in a master-slave configuration. But there's challenges with that because the signal power is too low, so you have to amplify it. Um, so that actually would require possibly uh, you know, some, some actual hardware work, not just software, to make this happen here. But then otherwise, you know, hopefully you could see that you could reuse all of your, you know, these operations here but you might need to modify these components here. This is not that hard because you have matrix inverse in there already, and this is back to things that you already have. So this would be hardware, this would be new algorithms, and then at the transmit side, you have to come up with a new training structure that would let you implement these algorithms here. But it's not that hard, and I've toyed with the idea of including MIMO in the labs here, but the problem is it would be like the last week right now, and. And it seems like that, that, that maybe, maybe it's a two-week lab, at, at least. So it's not here. Um, but if you take my space-time wireless class, you could implement this as part of your project there, if you want. All right, so questions? No questions. Yes, question. All right. Yes. Yes. Well, this is NR here and this is NT out. So the, the channel inverse is um, going to be NT by NR. So multiply it onto 
the received vectors which are of dimension n r, and you get n t out. Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. So that's this is where the the magic happens here in changing the dimensionality. It's right there. Sorry. So if you had like a hundred received antennas and two transit antennas, this H inverse would be of dimension two by one hundred, and it would combine all those outputs and give you two very good. Inputs to the symbol detectors. All right, so that's the block diagram here. Let's see where are we? Um, timing. Time is not good today, so we have to start late here. So I'll take a short break here now. This is a topic that um, I found on. Uh, I think to be fair, I should mention this on BBC here. News, which is what I read in the morning when I'm trying to to wake up here. And what 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 this article is about here is that um, Amazon wants to use uh, drones. This is a you can't quite see it here, but this is one of these like quadcopters. So it's it's like a helicopter with four uh, rotors on it, and they're very stable. They they can be you know flown in all different directions here. So they want to use um, drones built from these quadcopters to deliver stuff. So they actually want to, um, you know, in Austin, let's say, there's like a big factory, you know, and you place an order, and, and if it's something that they have on hand, which is a good chance they have it on hand because they do a lot of data mining and they predictive analytics and they have a good sense of what people want, so that's stocked in the factory, it's not too heavy, then, you know, the drone here picks up your books or whatever, and then flies it to your, presumably your drone landing pad instead of mailbox, and drops it off. So, I don't know, that just seems like really cool to me. And, you know, this is using navigation. There's, there's definitely going to be wireless in here as well. Um, but, I, know, I just thought this was like, like really cool here. Anyone have any comments on this? Yeah. Oh yeah. Will will they be safe? Yeah. Well, you know, there's all the issues like like we've seen with my colleague at um, in the wireless group, uh, Todd Humphreys, hacking into drones and taking control of them. So you could see that people would be, you know, trying to take control of these drones and steer them into other people. You know, even if these rotors here are made of plastic, um, at a minimum, it can hurt a lot if not kill you. Um, I have one of these really small micro toy helicopters, and I've whacked myself with it, and it, you know, obviously I didn't kill myself, and I'm still here. But um, you know, these would have to be a little more robust to pick up, say, five or ten pounds. And yeah, this would probably be pretty dangerous. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it would work here. Yeah, I don't know, though. It just seems, like, really amazing. Any other comments here? Safety? Yeah, that's another good question, too, right? I mean, I mean, there's probably a much larger group of people that want to steal it and a much smaller group that want to hurt people with it. But, well, I don't know. I mean, how... how you know, it depends. I mean, if it's like 10 feet up, you can get like a big net with a pole, you know, and kind of kind of grab it, right? But if it, you know, if it, look, re realistically, if we wanted to steal one of these, we would make our own remote-controlled plane and, you know, go up and be just like, you know, dogfighting, and we'd go and grab it and take it down. I mean, actually, yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a great idea. Man, I wish I had some ideas that were would turn into like, you know, commercially viable and non-illegal products. Hmm. Excellent question. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows, you know, I guess. Yeah, you would think. Yep, yep, yep. I can't tell you here. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it seems like there there must be some 
application of this perhaps on a campus environment which is not um, open to the whole world, you know, so, so maybe it could happen there. But yeah, it, does, it just does seem really far-fetched that these are going to be flying all around and dropping off these packages anytime soon. Hmm. Yeah, otherwise, yeah, really all we need is a big pole and a big, uh, big net. Yeah. Or even just one of those casting nets you use in fishing. I mean, if you can throw it up there. Yeah, I mean... Airsoft, yeah, I mean, exactly, you know, there's just a lot of options here. Hmm. Good. A rock. A rock. You mean like an actual rock? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I mean, well, why not just pick it up after it drops the package off? Just follow it and pick the package up. Yeah. Of course, it could drop it like I don't know in the backyard or something. I mean, okay, for this, okay, for that to make sense, I think you would need a um, like a secure chimney on your roof where you could it could drop the package in. So that would avoid the person just stealing it easily, and also that would keep it at a reasonably high altitude. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they they have no permission right now to fly these, right? So they'll have to be they'll have to get permission, and there's all kinds of airspace issues that will have to be implemented here. You know, I mean, would they file flight plans? Um, how would these flight plans interfere with other air traffic? It'll probably be pretty low. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, think about this here. This is going to potentially be a, a big source of um, you know jobs funding. Money, uh, covert activities, I don't know. Hmm. You think it's just marketing? They're just trying to advertise that Amazon is great? Oh, that's, that's so discouraging. Right. Pizza being delivered like that. And yeah, exactly. Pizza. Pizza. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and then in theory, all that stuff should get cheaper. Right. Of course, in practice, it'll just mean bigger profit margin for the company. So, yeah. In fact, it's just be like a twenty dollar delivery fee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, there's money to be made here. And if they're making money, they can hire more engineers to help engineer more cool stuff and pay them. So, you know, so you have to look at it from our, our perspective here. Fewer jobs for the people driving the truck, more jobs for the engineers engineering the drone. Yeah. Ah, man, this is great here. Well, anyways, I think. Enough time on that there, but yeah, that's uh, something coming. We'll see. Maybe it is just marketing ploy. I'm so susceptible to that. Okay, so the next, let's say, 10 minutes, we're going to talk about MIMA OFDM here. And so you should be able to essentially just explain what is MIMA OFDM and then draw the appropriate transmit receive block diagram. So the motivation for this is just really that, um, you know, normally we're using wide bandwidths and the channels are frequency selective. And so if you apply MIMO in a frequency selective channel, you need a much more complicated receiver structure than I've, I've shown you right now. I mean, you need, a, a, at a minimum, something that's called a space-time equalizer. Or a more complex detection. And I guess I should say more complicated detection, <coughs> since we use complex for the complex numbers here. And the reason is that you have mutual interference coming from all the different antennas, and now it's spread over time. So you know, the receiver, it's possible to do this. Um, we won't go through the derivation of this. We actually do this in the space-time 
wireless class here. So it's possible to, to modify our block diagram to work with, with frequency selective channels, but the complexity goes up a lot. So the alternative is to use OFDM modulation. And so MIMO OFDM, it just essentially combines the MIMO and the OFDM modulation techniques here. So it combines them both together so that you get the benefits of, you know, MIMO, high rates, and OFDM, low equalization complexity. So both of these are, um, you yeah, know, so you get the benefits of both here. And, and because of this, MIMO OFDM is the de facto way that MIMO is being applied in commercial systems. So it's what's used in, in LTE, and in WiMAX, in 802.11n, 802.11ac, is this combination of MIMO and OFDM here. So essentially to just, you know, I explain what it is and exactly how it works here. So first of all, um, let's let's consider a frequency selective channel here now if it's a frequency selective mimo channel what that means is that i've got a set of taps that are matrices and so instead of having L plus 1 coefficients, I now have L plus 1 matrices. And the input-output relationship, if I have a frequency-selective channel, you know, in discrete time, after synchronization, all of that, might look something like this here. And what you can see here is that um, what this, what's happening with this operation is, let's look at the kth receive antenna here. So this is an inner product here between the coefficients of this h and the vector of s here. So what we get is something that looks like this here, sum from l equals 0 to l. So I'll write out that this is going to be h of k comma 1 of l h of k comma 2 of l dot 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 h of k comma n t of l times s1 n minus l dot 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 s n t n minus l So the, com the complexity here comes from, you know, we've got a convolution now, and we've also got multiple transmit signals passing through all these different channels here. And so equalization in this, in this would be rather tricky here. So what we're going to do is, so, so we can avoid dealing directly with this channel here, we're going to apply OFDM to the signal sent from each antenna. So to make this more concrete, I'm going to draw it out here, what I mean here, at least the beginning part of this block diagram here. So effectively, we've got our symbols here coming in S of n here. So we're going to first put them into the spatial multiplexer here to generate n, an nt dimension vector here. So each output here is then going into the serial to parallel 1 to n converter here. The output of this is going to pass into an n IFFT, an endpoint IFFT matrix here. The output of that 
We're going to add the cyclic prefix. And then the output of this is going to be converted back into a parallel to serial, n plus l to 1 converter. Then this will go into the up sampler and filtering, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then here, there's a dot, dot, dot here. So we also have this right here goes into a serial to parallel, 1 to n. Etc. here, without having to draw out the whole thing again. So what you see here is that we've done the spatial multiplexing here first, and then after that, it looks just like the OFDM modulation. We take those symbols, we do the whole OFDM thing, filtering, etc. here. So that's basically the idea of using OFDM here. And we can show, using the same derivation as a single antenna case and the reason the same derivation works is that we have linearity right here so we're going to get a linear combination of the signal sent from the transmitter so the, the same trick with the cyclic prefix discarding it creating a circular convolution. Here we're going to create a vector circular convolution and um, because of linearity of the FFT operation we can rewrite this entire input-output relationship as something like this here. Where this index of K is the subcarrier. And this y tilde is in the frequency domain. And this right here is the frequency response of the channel. It's also in the frequency domain. Which is, and, and the reason I'm putting the tildes here is because we were using capital before to be in the frequency domain. So it's kind of confusing with the capital also being the matrix. So this is just the sum from L equals 0 to L, H of L, E to minus J, 2 pi K L over capital N here. So this is, you take the impulse response of your channel and you take the Fourier transform. So effectively what this does here is if we look at h of m comma p tilde of k here that's just equal to the endpoint dft of h m comma p of n here and that's just, again, because of the linearity here. So effectively, you take every impulse response between every transmitter and receive antenna, zero pad, take its DFT, stack them all together, and that creates our H tilde here of K. Okay, so any questions about this here? Now, to save some time, I'm not going to redraw the block diagram here, but you can see from the transmit side effectively what's changed here. So we take our previous spatial multiplexing block diagram, we add this new hunk of processing here. And then on the receive side, we would end up with... Um, you know, this, this part here would look similar, but then over here, instead of having the zero forcing receiver, we would now have um, something like discard cyclic prefix. Well, let's see, it would be, you know, the conversion from 1 to n plus L 
where we take the blocks of the OFDM, we discard cyclic prefix, we take the DFT, and then we invert per subcarrier the outputs here. And um, so this, effectively, this whole thing would be replicated per subcarrier. And we'd have the, the OFDM action happening there in the middle. But hopefully, you would be able to draw that out if asked on the final exam, for example. So any questions about that? So effectively, we have converted the, um, basically, we've converted this, which is the input-output relationship of a multiple input-multiple-output system, we've, FIR, and we've converted this into this here. So now we have only the matrix equalization operation. We don't have to use a space-time equalizer. And so that's really the benefit here of OFDM is getting rid of the multiple time taps here and replacing it with this here. All right, so no questions on this? All right, so let's, I guess we have plenty of time for the final topic here, which is more or less unrelated to MIMO, but it's something that I wanted to mention is it's on a link budget here. So what I'd like you to be able to do here is explain the concept of a link budget, and then I'm going to go through a calculation from uh, one of the 3G cellular systems, and so I would hope that you would be able to explain and justify the different steps of that calculation. So this is the link budget. So a link budget is called a budget because it's an accounting of how the power is spent. On a link here. So it's not it's not about you know how much does it cost to build a transmitter and receiver, et cetera. It's really about spending power on the different things that consume power on the link. Losses in the cables, um, fading, shadowing, you know, being far away from the transmitter. All of those things require us to have more um, power here. So the, the generally, link budget is, is something that is, is almost an art in terms of its calculation here because a really good link budget will include many different practical effects. It requires understanding a lot of different aspects of how the entire system works, not just the signal processing, not just the RF, but you have to know about each of those different pieces here. Um, it depends on many things, including the type of a service here that you're offering. Is this voice or data? and what kind of quality you're expecting here. This drives the target bit error rate that's required. It also depends on the environment through um, different assumptions about the channel, including so path loss, shadowing, Etc. here, and then depends on the system configuration. So number of antennas, the gain of those antennas, losses, if there's any diversity, et cetera, here. So it's a complicated um, topic, we're just primarily going to go through this one example here. So I'll show you that example now. This is one that um, you can download and play with off of the UMTS website here. 
The UMTS is the name of the um, the 3G PP wideband CDMA uh, standard. It stands for something like uni Universal Mobile Terrestrial Service, I think. So essentially what I want to do now is just go through this um, link budget just to give you an idea of how the budget is um, calculated here. And also, um, it, it's in particular, the way it's done here, it's not exactly um, done in a, necessarily in a straightforward way here. So first of all, let's start with the amount of money that we have, which is the power. So this is the uplink. So we're talking about this is the maximum power at a mobile station, cell phone. And they're computing that as um, 0.125 watts in dBm is 21 dBm. Now, that's actually not the power we use for the link budget because they account for um, this being a 3G system, people actually talking on their phone. We're, talking, we're going to compute this for voice. So they allow for um, some additional loss due to body loss minus antenna gain. And so they account for that as, as a total of 2 dB. So the actual transmit power we have to work with, which is called the EIRP, effective isotropic radiated power, is, is 19. So this quantity here could be made up if you had like a larger antenna, a more a high gain on your antenna, you could reduce that. If you have more body loss, that would go up here. And so the body loss, these things are a function of frequency coming from measurements. It depends a lot on the configuration. So this is just a, you know, it's, it's, it's a, the link budget is not extraordinarily precise here. It's an estimate. Okay, so now we start off with the, um, a lot of these calculations here are done in um, dB here. So let's look at this right here. So the first thing is the BTS, this is base transceiver station. It's base station for short here, noise density. This is given in dBm per hertz. This is basically n naught, but it's a little more than n naught here because they're also accounting for the noise figure. The noise figure is, is essentially by having better RF components, you reduce the effective temperature and you can get lowered noise power. So we, we didn't discuss that in class. That's something if you take an RF circuits class, you'll go through. But the effect is that we take what would normally be 174 dBm per hertz. And here, because of the noise figure that they're assuming, they add 6 dB to that here. So this is basically the, the effective n naught we're using in dBm per hertz. Now, to compute the received noise power, we're going to multiply that quantity by the bandwidth of our signal. So the bandwidth of this, the signal that's used in UMTS is 3.84 megahertz here. So this is the, you know, so if we're looking at the actual signal power, it's going to be 10 log 10 of n naught plus 10 log 10 of the bandwidth. 10 log 10 of n naught is minus 168. 10 log 10 of the bandwidth is right here. So that's the, the bandwidth here. So interference margin, this is um, just a function of the kind of the coding and the fact that they're using um, in, in that standard there. So that's, they're putting that here as 3 dB. Um, I'm actually not entirely sure. Let me think here, 3 dB. Yeah, this is the one confusing calculation here. So the... Um, Okay, so that's interference margin. So then to compute the received interference power, they're adding here, so this is a minus 102, so this is the received noise power, plus 3. Okay, so that's assuming that the total noise is 3 dB above the received noise power. So I guess that's the interference margin here. And then there's, a, so this is all in dB, so we're converting it to linear. And they're subtracting off the contribution due to just the noise and then converting that back into dB here. Um, and you get roughly, again, 102.2 here. So 
this is this actually is a calculation. I was messing around with it in the spreadsheet here, trying to get exactly what's happening here, but that seems to be what's going on here. So effectively, they're saying that. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So this is. Yeah. So they're saying that the received interference power is um, 3 dB above the noise power. So that's the interference margin. And then here, they're calculating the noise and interference power in total, which should be 3 dB difference. Yeah, so this is 102 plus 102, so that should be 3. So that's why that's a 3 dB difference there. Okay. All right, so that, I guess that makes sense here. Now, then the processing gain, all right, so then this is the total noise plus interference here. So normally in this class, we neglect interference. So for the purpose of the link budget, they're just adding additional interference as noise. All right, now we have a processing gain. The processing gain, this comes from the fact that this UMTS system uses CDMA, code division multiple access. Also, which we didn't discuss in class, but it, it gives additional, um, you can think about it like error, uh, error control coding gain um, to the signal here. So that's something that we haven't done, but that comes from just Essentially, it's the difference between the bandwidth and the actual rate of the signal here. They call it processing gain. This is the required dB over N0 for speech. That's 5 dB. So that's essentially the required SNR for speech, 5 dB. Antenna gain of 17 dBi. This is rather large because this is the receive antenna at the base station. So it's, it's a big antenna, so it's 17 dB. These are the cable and connector losses, 3 dB. Think about that for a second here. Half of our power gets lost in the cable. That's, that's quite a lot, but that's, that's actually what happens there. And then fast fading margin here. This is one of the things that I would expect that you could compute from what we've done in class. So this would be the difference between like the Rayleigh fading curve under a certain assumption of diversity and the Gaussian curve here. So this is our you know, fast fade margin. I would expect that you can compute this one here. All right, so then the total receiver sensitivity here is computed as, this is the noise and interference power allowed. And then, Let's see if I got this right here. Minus 25 dB. So that's the processing gain. But because it's processing gain, we can allow effectively, um, it effectively reduces the noise interference. So we subtract it. Required dB over N0 for speech. That's added, 5. This is a tenant gain of 17, so we subtract it. We add the gain, we add the loss. And then we subtract, sorry, we add the, the margin here. So the quantities here that are consuming more power are the fast fading, the cable and connector loss, and this EB over N0 target here. So this means that our signal has to be 5 dB above noise here. So these things are subtracting. And then this additional coding gain and the antenna gain are adding. And because they're adding, we, because we're computing the loss, we subtract them out here. That's what gives us the 129 here. Now, the difference between 129 and 19 is 148. So that's the total allowable path loss in the system here. So at this point, we take this 148 here. This Soft handover gain, this is a gain that comes from a particular technique that's used in CDMA. And this is log normal fading margin. This is the extra 7 dB that we're adding because there might be shadowing here. So this is actually the shadowing loss here. So we're going to subtract 7 and add 3, and that gives us 144 here. So this is our total loss that we are allowed to have on a link. So we take that loss and we plug it into a link budget equation. This one is called the Okamura-Hara model. It's one of the empirically derived path loss models. So you take this, 
you plug it in here, and you get out the range. If you look at this model here, you can see that there's a distance dependent term here, log of r, multiplied by 35.2, so that means the path loss exponent's 3.52. And then this is the loss term here. So they've taken the allowable total path loss, the link budget here, and then computed the range of a cell that's allowed under all of these different assumptions here. So that's, that's what um, a practical link budget looks like. So one that we might consider based on what we've learned in class would be you start with the transmit power, we compute a, we, we would neglect interference, we, we would neglect the noise figure, so we'd just compute the received noise figure from the Boltzmann's constant. You would neglect processing gain, I would give you like a target SNR, we neglect antenna gain, neglect connect connector losses, you compute fast fade margin from the, um, like the, the, depending on whatever diversity technique you're using, Rayleigh channel, Alamuti code, you compute some quantity here, and then compute the total receiver sensitivity and path loss, and then based on that, compute the distance here, so. All right, so that's a path, that's a link budget here example. So any questions about this here? Questions, questions, no questions here. There's no way this can be very clear, so the fact that there is no questions is, is a concern, but that's fine. I, I'm happy to, you know, reuse this example as is on the final, without the numbers, of course. All right. Well... With that here, let's see. So to summarize here, what we've done today is we have looked at the, let's see. Ah. So a spatial multiplexing system, you should be able to draw that block diagram out. So, and the, also the point of this was to understand what additional complexity is required at the transmitter and receiver. And we reviewed this concept of MIMO OFDM combining OFDM with a spatial multiplexing system. Now, also, I did not explain beamforming or space time coding. It can also be applied in MIMO OFDM. It can actually be applied in different ways per subcarrier, across subcarriers, across OFDM symbols. It's more complicated. That is done in the space time wireless course. And then the final thing that we did was we talked about. Um, Link budgets here. Where's my link budget sheet? I think we talked about link budgets. Yes. Hmm. Ah, here it is. Okay. And the point here was just to to review. First of all, define the concept of a link budget, and then to go through an example calculation. In, in a sense, I wanted you to, to understand that you know, wireless systems are a bit more complicated than we consider in class. And doing the link budget calculation is actually um, requires you know, a lot of information about the entire system here. But we do have enough knowledge from the propagation parts of the class and the parts we did on diversity to compute at least a few of the quantities that are used in the link budget. And so that's it. So we'll see you all Friday. Once I have the time confirmed for the, the lecture, I will email it out to you here. <laughs>